but i'm not doing it because i think already many people think i'm a nut and i don't <laughs> want somebody to think that it's all part of my imagination <laughs> Namaste world raisers, Sabine and Roger here and today we're going to watch a stunning first person account of a modern mystic with Sri M. Awesome, can't wait for this. Uh, I know very little about Sri M. The only thing I really know about him is that you guys love him. <laughs> we got a lot of requests uh, and a modern mystic so I'm all about this spiritual journey and mysticism. So I look forward to learning about a brand new teacher. So let's dive right into it. It is one of the most curious stories Soldiers has ever recorded. Hmm. Discovered at the end of this bumpy road, at the ashram of a holy man. <laughs> the amazing first person account of Sri M. Guru to many, and author of what's said to be among India's fastest selling book on spirituality. Sri wow. M lives in his ashram in Madhnapali, India, in the state of Andhra Pradesh. And his book, Apprentice to a Himalayan Master, a Yogi's Autobiography, is available on Amazon. Born into a Muslim family as Mumtaz Ali Khan, Sri M is considered to be one of India's leading contemporary mystics. As a young man, he lived for several years in the Himalayan mountains with his teacher, Mahesh Wamath Babaji. Sri M tells of meeting in person Shirdi Sai Baba, Sri Mahavatar Babaji, serpent spiritual beings from another galaxy, J. Krishnamurti, and many others. Welcome to Soldiers, part one of Sri M. <laughs> this interview was recorded in Sri M's home in Madhnapali, India, in December of 2012. Sri M, Mr. N, Madhu, thank you for this opportunity to be with us on Soul Journeys as people learn more about how to advance their own spiritual self. You were born to a Muslim family. What led you to move beyond it to explore the secrets of the Himalayan rishis, swamis, and gurus? Yes, you're right. I was born in a Muslim family, but, um, you know, one comes with a lot of uh, background into this world except that some people uh, don't remember uh, some do i happen to be one of those uh, exceptions who remembers <laughs> and therefore even though i was uh, i was born in a, a religion which is different you see the problem is all religions have been founded on some kind of mystical experience. Mm -hmm. True. The, as days go by, as years go by, the, the inner mystic experience is kind of uh, covered up by the outward practices. So, even though Islamic religion appears on most part to be a practical thing for five times prayer and all that kind of thing, and that this path is the only true path and I, there is only one holy book and there is one prophet and so on. Deep down there is a mystic streak in Islam which is called the Sufi. So when I was a young child, my first experience of the Sufi uh, understanding of Islam was my grandmother telling me stories about the Sufis. I see. Right. Now, it's quite natural that once you get into the mystic stream and you have a background of the past, you don't then confine yourself to Sufi or Islam, you go forward. You kind of uh, get over it and go beyond. Years ago, when I started more seriously on this path as a novice, I quickly came to understand that those who were the mystics at the top of Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, they had more in common with one another, it seemed, right. than with people of their own. Absolutely. Yeah. It's true. So as I went along, I found that here was a teaching which appealed to me very naturally as something which was not dogmatic in any sense. It was an exploration. It was a, it was a, 
You see, all the Upanishads, for instance, are dialogues between the rishis and the students. So nobody is asked to believe anything. They're conversations. Yeah, they, nobody is asked to believe. The understanding is, okay, explore and find out for yourself. The this, authority is the listener who concludes on his own or her own what they're Absolutely, to. absolutely. It's not a question of do's and don'ts. It's a question of understanding and exploring, which is what attracted me to the Hindu system of thought. You said that you thought all young boys had a deep interest in God. When did you realize that you were the exception to the rule? Oh, I can tell you one or two examples. When I found a religious person or heard someone talking about a religious experience, or when I went to uh, passed across a temple or a church or any religious place, I would feel a deep stirring in my heart, which uh, you cannot logically explain. And even now, in those days, impossible because my vocabulary was quite limited. Even now, I cannot explain this feeling because it's beyond ordinary reason. It came from the soul. I didn't know that it is because of my past birth and experiences at that point. But now I know why. So, uh, that was one thing. The other was that the experience I had when I was around eight, nine years old. When my guru um, in this life, Maheshwar Nath Babaji, out of the blue suddenly appeared in Trivandrum, on the backyard of the house in which I was, uh, where, I, where we lived, and touched me on my head with his right hand, saying in Hindi, when the time comes, everything will be fine. After that, I have never been the same. He materialized. He didn't just walk in off. Well, the... you know, I can't say whether he materialized or not, because we had a very small compound wall at the back. And when I first saw him under the jackfruit tree, I thought that some kind of a beggar or someone has jumped across the wall, because I didn't see him come. And I didn't see him go, but I didn't see him materialize out of thin air. Except that when I looked, there was somebody there. And then he gestured and I went close. The normal reaction should be that you should get frightened because there's a sure. stranger, but I was not. Which also I cannot explain. Now I can, but not at that point. So I went towards him and uh, he put his right hand on my head and said this. And then he said, go back. So I turned and walked back. It's quite a distance, the backyard, it's quite long. So by the time I reached the kitchen door at the back and turned around to see, he was not there. Mm. Uh, I didn't see him, you know, like poof, coming or going or anything <laughs> of that kind. He just wasn't there. He wasn't there. Uh, now, the thing is, Every time I tried to speak of this experience to anybody, first person of course was my mother who was cooking in the kitchen. I found that my tongue was literally what you call tongue-tied. <laughs> I couldn't speak. I could say anything except that. So this went on for many, many years till I kind of disappeared into the Himalayas at the age of 19 or so. But then from that day, every night I got into what is called the natural meditation. I call it natural meditation because I felt something beautiful in the heart center and I closed my eyes. Most often I just lay down and did it because in the middle of the night if you sit up and meditate they might think there's something wrong with this guy. So because we all used to be in one room. So you sleep. did it secretively? I did very secretly <laughs> and I had many many experiences from that time onwards that started off. There's so much I want to ask, and, I, and we have a limited time, but I must go back to what you said at the very beginning, that you are among the few who were able to remember your previous lives, your previous lessons. Does that make you one in a million or one in seven billion? Because I don't know of too many other people. I can't say this exactly the number, but I think every human being has some 
hint or the other about his life he meets somebody and suddenly becomes very close he doesn't know why and then sometimes you hate someone for no reason you think that no, why do i hate them? there are some connections and you go to some places you feel very familiar but in my case i began to understand these things much more clearly you had a download almost like a I, computer download that's right. of an encyclopedic yeah. understanding of your previous lives yes and in fact i'm planning in the future but i'm not doing it because i think already many people think i'm a nut and i don't <laughs> want somebody to think that it's all part of my imagination because i am very much in my mind to write a book called the past four lives of m the past four lives it'll be a best it's already destined to be a best seller <laughs> i am power, I, i am powerfully attracted to your story for many reasons first of all my wife and i Jody Cleary my wife profoundly loves your story and believes it and she couldn't wait till I read it and we couldn't wait to hear you say yes to an interview so number one th- thank for that i am powerfully attracted to your story because it reminds me of some other stellar spiritual autobiographies the stories of swami rama paramahansa yogananda paul brunton a journalist such as myself but had huge opening through ramana maharshi but there's an exception to their stories because you are a contemporary of ours of mine in age i'm older than you are so in age as far as age goes we're contemporaries this brings your truly unbelievable tale to my generation are there many people do you think still having today what you experienced in the himalayas and in front of the jackfruit tree when you were a child what did you ask what are there are there many people having the experiences I that you've been given i don't think so not many but there are do you communicate with them well i you know in the spiritual field you're linked always with others mm-hmm. who are in this particular field but most people are unknown mm-hmm. there are lots of people uh, who are so silent as the grass that you walk upon that you unless they choose to reveal you cannot catch them <laughs> <laughs> you've told your story in a best selling book in 2011 which is destined to be internationally best selling I, i i know when your guru sent you back home after many years in the mountains you found your father reading a favorite of mine Paul Brunton's In Search of Hidden India, Secret, Secret India. India, Secret India. It's still one of the best introductions of eastern spirituality for the west. Right. Did he start this ball rolling with giving us westerners an insight into spiritual thought? You mean Paul Brunton? Yes. I think in a way it's true, but there have been other writers who were not so popular. Mm-hmm. the books didn't sell so well one of the most important writers who are not indian and who really explored inquired practiced not just theoretically but practiced the ancient science of tantra and wrote on it was sir john odroff sir john, john odroff odroff who wrote under the name of um, arthur avalon Arthur his, Avalon. Of course his best known book is The Serpent Power but there are other like Introduction to Tantra uh, you know very many book uh, I think but thing is with Paul Brunton it was an easy style uh, this was a little too scholarly and in-depth study but not like Paul Brunton's Paul Brunton's was uh, very persuasive because it told the story from a seeker's point of view right. who is also a skeptic yes and yes. both of those are powerful combinations so when he finds frauds and fakes and charlatans Absolutely. and then finds right. the genuine artist maharishi yeah it's very very uh, powerful apart from that um you should also appreciate the fact that there was the great swami vivekananda Of course he came went to America to the west yes and that was when people woke up and said here is a a treasure from india yeah he was the very first i think so yes uh this is important to me as a youth you were interested very much in the life of shirdi sai baba right. was it because he appealed to muslims and hindus alike or was it for another reason no 
it's not because he appealed to Muslims and Hindus or anything of that kind. I have, I had this deep attraction towards him, which I attribute to my past life connections with him, hmm. which I have not revealed neither in my autobiography nor anywhere else. <laughs> you said that in your book, but you said when it's time you will. Right. Is it time now? Do you want to start no. revealing more now? <laughs> no, no. I think I had done too much of revealing now. I used to lead a quiet life here, you know, and now it's become difficult. <laughs> but your, your teachers, including Mahavatar Babaji, told you, directed you, led you, to know that this was going to happen. So you have to do your duty, I, I would think. To, I have to. I, I used to always talk. Maheshwanath Babaji would ask me, what do you think? I told you between my, you and me, what's the, what's the attitude? You have? I said, I'm your dog. I sit before <laughs> you, I look at you, I stare at you, I whine when I'm hungry. <laughs> and he said to me, but don't shake your tail too much. Don't wag, is what you <laughs> told us earlier. Don't wag your tail too much. <laughs> uh, that's going to say something, but I won't hold it back because it's personal. My, my wife accuses me of wagging too much. So when I first heard this, I was very excited. I almost thought you read my mind. <laughs> Let me ask you one other question about this because you said earlier, and and I believe you when you said that uh, Mahesh Ornath Babaji, Babaji simply appeared to you in front of the jackknife tree when you were a child. Yeah. So he could have crawled over the wall for all I know. But the materialization that has to have been a genuine materialization was when Shirdi Sai Baba did the same thing and then turned into your teacher. Right. And so when he came and told you right. what as, you say you can't reveal as yet. As far as Shirdi Sai Baba is concerned, my experience in the book which I have written is not a vision. It's not a vision, it's an actual fact. It's it, real. Uh, for me. Yeah. It was absolutely real. You saw this man. I saw this man. And it was I sure saw this Baba. man. I felt this man. No no vision gives you a bunch of currency notes, money and says, Go. Which vision can give you <laughs> And this man who has been had been dead for several years. That's what we thought you. that he is dead, but he is not this is exactly what I'm saying. And in spiritual matters, you know, in, in the spiritual field is materializing uh, as these tiny things and all. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Well, the contemporary of Shirdi Sai, mm -hmm. such as I said, mm -hmm. those are my tinsel trinkets and trash that I give you so that you come for what I really have to give you. Your problem, understanding. The problem is people get stuck with the trash. Oh, I know. I know. It's, it's like candy. It's like it's for instance, somebody waves his hand and makes ash and puts it, then everybody thinks, oh, he's a big man. Where did that it's come a, from? I I'm just telling you. Yeah, but so, where did that just come from? And it has a beautiful smell. <laughs> <laughs> so, he's a... <laughs> I not such a big that. deep. Yeah, I want to know that. Where did that come so, from? I can't but believe what I, I just don't, saw. But I don't do it because I don't want people to get caught with this. Oh, they, have to, they have to find themselves. <laughs> May, before no, you, before we have you, to stop this. <laughs> Show me your hand one more time because I didn't see it close enough, if you will. I know we have to stop this and we'll stop it one day, but but not today. No. Okay. <laughs> well, this is what I'm talking about. So these are not what I'm trying to say is I I it, it came it happened now just for you to know. That it's not a big deal. It had a jasmine fragrance to it. It had a beautiful... <laughs> not a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Holy smokes. Fascinating. Excellent. I wow. really enjoy this. Really wonderful. Wow. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. Just his experience. Yeah, and just yeah. saying that, yeah, so many people can't believe, but... For genuine spiritual seekers, you're going to come across, you know, teachings and stories like this, right? I remember, you know, stories just Tibetan Buddhism, right? Like <laughs> rainbow body beings that can materialize. And I'm even reminded of, uh, you know, Jesus after the crucifixion and how he reappeared to his disciples, mm -hmm. right? You know, and that seems so mind-blowing, but... Yeah, of course it's possible, especially where there's that deep connection. And he was obviously connected from previous lifetime to his teacher, 
just like the disciples were, you know, so connected to Jesus that he could, you know, appear before them, right? So I believe it. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Amazing. I love, I love. He's so sweet. Love Shri M so far. That's fascinating. Yeah, mm. I'm going to have to get his book. <laughs> yeah, put that on the list. But uh, yeah, awesome. So uh, thanks for joining us for part one. And <laughs> yeah, we're going to keep going. So part two coming up. <laughs>